The Gospel of John is a singular gospel. It is separate, separate from the synoptic gospels, the content of the story and the kind of Jesus story that is narrated in the Gospel of John. It's very different from the sort of presentation of Jesus that we get in the synoptics. The Gospel of John is generally thought of as the most spiritual of the Gospels, the most abstract, in some respects the most difficult to interpret. It's thought to have been written around the year 90, probably after the synoptics have reached their first uh, formulation. And traditionally it was written by the disciple John in Ephesus, but of course it turns out that we don't know very clearly who the author is or what the provenance is. It turns out, though, that the Gospel of John was among the most influential of the early Christian writings. Many of the creeds of Christianity, which were later developed, are a, a product of gleaning from the Gospel of John. John is the abstract Gospel. John is the Gospel which shows us what I would describe as the mystical aspect of Jesus, which separates it in tone and also separates it in character from the synoptics as a whole. Now, John also influenced the development of Gnostic Christianity, which is one of the, the great sort of religious dead ends in the Western tradition. The orthodox interpretation of Christianity that emerged in subsequent centuries uh, was met with resistance, and there was a Gnostic tradition, a tradition of esoteric knowledge within the Christian tradition, which derived many of its sources, many of its ideas from the Gospel of John because of the abstract and symbolic and uh, difficult nature of the text. So although John himself, um, or at least the author who uh, wrote John, also wrote the Epistle of John, and the Epistle of John is a sort of reaction to the emergence of Gnosticism, which his Gospel actually helped generate. But beyond that, the Gospel of John is intended as a sort of synopsis, or summation, or finishing off of the Gospel stories, and it is self-consciously trying to construct a sort of a, of a, a fugue, a spiritual unification of the great themes that are presented to us in the Synoptic Gospels. Now, the sources of the Gospel of John are larger and more extensive than those for the synoptics simply because of the question of time. Um, certainly John had access to the Q document, certainly he had access to an oral tradition, and he is able to glean important ideas from the synoptics themselves. But in addition to that, he has access to a, to a source of information about Jesus that the synoptics did not have, which is one of the reasons why the Gospel of John is unique. In the same way that the synoptics are thought to be the product of the Q document, a hypothetical document reconstructed by scholars on the basis of certain similarities in the text, scholars currently hold the view that the Gospel of John has access to something called the Signs Gospel, which is, like Q, a hypothetical document, but which is not merely a fantasy on the part of scholars. It is a document for which we have a, a fair amount of indirect information. Now, the Signs Gospel would be a hypothetical record of Jesus' doings, particularly his miracles. It will not be like Q or the Gospel of Thomas, a sayings gospel. Rather than saying that Jesus said this and Jesus said that and Jesus said the other, which is what we believe Q was like, what the Signs Gospel would be is a series of Jesus' miracles. So he heals the, uh, the lame man, and he gives eyesight to the blind, and he feeds the 5,000, and he walks on water, and he calms the sea. The idea being that the Signs Gospel Gospel just shows the miraculous events in Jesus' life. It tries to emphasize the divinity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus is, day, is played down in the Gospel of John. It's the divinity, the mystical aspect of this Gospel that has always been most intriguing. Uh, it is generally thought of as the most difficult to interpret, and it is because of this abstract quality that it is quite difficult to, to get a handle on. Now, what, Mar what John is trying to do is bring together the Gospels and create something like a, a spiritual fugue of Gospel themes. Weave them all together so that they form a, a whole that is bigger than the sum of their component parts. And John does this in spades. He does this perhaps more successfully than any of the other Gospels. Um, from Mark, I would say John borrows the idea of eschatology, because Mark is the eschatological gospel. But what's different in, when we make the transition from Mark to John is not just 20 years of historical time. The eschatology in Mark is imminent. The end of the world is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. We expect 
it to happen any day. What John does is move the eschatology from imminent to continuous. It turns out that we are going to twist and alter the idea of eschatology and reformulate our understanding of the end of the world. The end of the world may be something very different from what we thought the end of the world would be. We may not have realized in, when we were reading the synoptics how rich and deep and full of suggestive pregnant connotations this end of the world concept is. So I'll come back to that in a little bit, but what I would emphasize is that it shares with, John shares with Mark this emphasis on eschatology. What it differ, the way it differs from Mark is that the eschatology is rendered personal rather than historical. It may be treated as an individual as well as a collective matter. This is one of the great spiritual breakthroughs of the Gospel of John. Now, in addition to the borrowing eschatology from Mark, from Matthew, John pulls the idea that there is a direct continuity between Jesus and the traditions of Jewish religion. Particularly, he emphasizes the epiphany that Moses has on Mount Sinai. Remember when Yahweh reveals himself to Moses and he says, I am who am, or I am that I am, the simple, awesome, dreadful presence of Yahweh is summed up in I am. You can't attach any predicate to Yahweh. All we can say about Yahweh is I am. Well, it turns out that the Gospel of John is shot through with I am statements. Jesus is always saying, I am the truth and the, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am, I am, I am, harkens back to that dreadful I am that Moses encounters on Sinai. So the idea that Jesus is the new Moses and that the Gospel message is continuous, an extension of the Jewish tradition, which we get in Matthew, is reconfirmed in John, spiritualized and made more abstract. So there's considerable borrowing from both Mark and Matthew, and it's these I am statements that mark it, that mark Jesus as being continuous with both Moses, because he God reveals himself to Moses in, through the vehicle of this I am. Uh, utterance, but also he's the other half of the epiphany as well. He is also Yahweh. In other words, Moses hears from Yahweh, I am. Jesus utters the statement, I am. So not only is he like Matthew, the new Mosaic lawgiver, he is also like the other half of the epiphany that Moses had. He is also the Yahweh half, both God and man simultaneously. There is some very delicate balancing of symbolism here, which we will repay you your very close reading. It's hard to get at first, but the, the balance between both halves of the epiphany, between the God and the man, is very prominent in this gospel. So what we see then in these pulling together is a sort of borrowing without diminishing, and he wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants all the tensions in the, in the earlier Gospels to be resolved in this one final perfect revelation. Now, in addition to the idea of continuity with Judaism that we get in Matthew or eschatology that we get in Mark, what John borrows from Luke is the universality of the covenant. And the universality of the covenant and the idea that we are moving from the old chosen people to a new chosen people, which is the entirety of the world potentially, which is the whole set of Christian believers, is a recapitulation of that universality that we see in Luke. Um, the triumph of the Spirit, the Logos, because Jesus is described here as the Word, the Logos, the eternal Word, um, the triumph of the Spirit or Logos is what makes Jesus the light of the world. The world cannot withstand the light of, of Jesus' moral teaching, and the universality of it is affirmed at the same time that the continuity with Judaism is affirmed that we get in Mark or in Matthew. So we are getting actually quite a, re a remarkable symbolic tour de force here, which self-consciously borrows from the gospel traditions and turns them into something more than they had been prior. Now, in addition to looking at borrowings that we get from the Synoptic Gospels, it's also worth thinking about some of the symbolism in Mark, or in John. John's symbolism is generally acknowledged to be the deepest, the most difficult, the most recondite of Gospel symbolism. And it's the abstract nature of the words that are used. For example, John describes Jesus as the Logos means word or speech or reason. It has a number of translations from Greek to English. The idea, though, is that the word is sacred. Do you remember uh, Professor Ford's 
argument about the sacredness of names and the magic powers of names in the traditions from, of the Hebrew Bible? Well, the same ki kind of conception of the power of words invests the idea of Jesus as Logos with a sort of abstract but cosmic significance. He is the universal word, the universal utterance. Perhaps we would want to connect the idea of Jesus as the divine word with the polyglossia that the apostles get or that the disciples get during the Pentecost. The divine word, the universality of communication, the undoing of all barriers between people, all of those are gestured at in describing Jesus as the divine word. And it's unique to John to describe Jesus as the Logos. The synoptics don't get to that level of symbolic depth. Now, there are a great many other references which Jesus makes to himself, all these I am statements, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, all of which connect back to the sort of stories that are told, because John is very careful about the kind of, of message or representation that he makes of Jesus. Unlike the synoptics, the Gospel of John has virtually no parables in it. There are miracles and there are signs, probably derived from the signs gospel, but parables in the usual sense of teaching stories or a, an earthly story with a, a heavenly message, we don't see that especially emphasized in John. There's very, very little of it. His intentions are greatly different. We have all the Jesus parables, or all the really important ones, already in the synoptics. He's looking for something bigger. He has a greater set of symbolic concerns. Now, Something that is worth your consideration and, and should be noted in, the, in your reading of the Gospel of John, but actually also in your reading of Scripture as a whole, is the importance of numerical symbols. Numbers are magic, not just words. In other words, while there is a certain degree of word magic and sacred words in the tradition of biblical religion that goes back to Genesis, number magic is at least as important in the traditions of biblical religion. And so whenever you see a quantity specified for anything in your reading of Scripture, stop and underline it. It means something. You are being told some special esoteric message when we get to any sort of quantity. Remember that in the ancient world, all of knowledge is one kind of messy bunch of ideas. Astronomy and astrology are still, are still the same discipline back when this book is being written. And mathematics and magic are still the same discipline. So it should come as no surprise then that the numbers that get introduced in the Gospels and also in the Hebrew Bible have symbolic significance far beyond what you might have expected. For example, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. Well, six is a very negative, unworthy number in the Gospels, and two is the number that symbolizes society. Two sixes, society is in a very evil state. As a matter of fact, all of the numbers have, or virtually all of the commonly used numbers in the Bible, have such symbolic significance. Have you noticed that the Bible seems to gravitate towards threes and sevens and twelves and forties? It's not just that the world parses itself like that. I'm, I'm sure that 13 things occasionally occurred in biblical times, that we occasionally saw 39 instead of 40, but 40 is a symbolic number, 12 is a symbolic number, 7 is symbolic. And for that reason, we are not being given a naturalistic rendering of the Jesus story. We are be being given a network of symbols. It's not until you recognize that the appearance and reality are quite different and the depth goes much further than you might expect that you really begin to appreciate the Gospels, in particular the Gospel of John. Let me briefly state what m some of the correspondences are between the numbers. It may help inform your uh, reading, in particular the Gospel of John, but of Scripture as a whole. The number one, God. Yahweh is the unique monotheistic entity. One is always associated with God. Two, on the other hand, is always associated with society. If you go back, say, to the book of Deuteronomy, you will find that the number of witnesses necessary to prove a charge against a malefactor is two. One witness will not be enough. Two is always the number of society. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Two is connected with the human social world. Three, on the other hand, is a heavenly number, a divine number. It's the Trinitarian number. Had you noticed that there's a lot of triads, a lot of three of things that cruises right through, particularly the Gospel of John, but all the Gospels? This is not accidental. Anytime you see three of something, heavenly references are being made. It is always celestial. Now, four is the number of the earth. Four is 
car is consistent with the four points of the compass, the four directions. It is consistent with this worldly things. It is symbolic of this world of space and time. Whenever you have four of something, you have the human world. When you have three of something, you have the celestial domain. The jump from three to four is not merely the addition of an integer. It is a symbolic transformation. Whenever you see such a transformation, stop and reread the passage. It will be of very great help to you. The number five is the number of man. Two arms, two legs, and a head. Whenever you see five of anything, imperfection and humanity is always being suggested. The number six is evil. It is incompleteness. It is moral corruption. Whenever you see six, something bad is going to happen in the Bible. When you see three sixes, the intensification of 666, as it's referred to in the book of the Apocalypse, the number symbolism is very deep. We have an extreme celestial example of evil. In other words, what we have is the number of the beast, the number of the Antichrist. It's not that John pulled the number 666 out of his head. It means something. Well, seven is the number of perfection. Had you noticed that seven is the uh, addition of three and four? It's the addition of heaven and earth? Well, it turns out then that perfection is seven. That's why we get seven of things in many cases. Whenever you see an example of seven of something happening in the Gospels, some union of heaven and earth is occurring at the symbolic level. Do not overlook that. It makes all the difference. Tw uh, Twelve is the number of harmony. Twelve tribes of Israel, twelve apostles. Twelve is a very complete number. When Judas is, uh, commits suicide and the, uh, the number of Jesus' followers is reduced to eleven, they have to get another one. Why? Because eleven is not an auspicious number. Twelve is the number, of complete, is the number of harmony, and that's what we will need in order to complete the group of Jesus' followers. And forty is the number of completion, finishing. Think of forty years in the desert in the book of Exodus. Think of Jesus wandering 40 days in the desert as he purifies himself prior to being tempted by Satan. 40 is not just one more than 39. 40 is the number of the completed task. And that makes all the difference. If you ever see 40 of anything in the Bible, something is being completed. Do not think it is one more than 39 or one less than, 30, than 41. Mathematics was not, could be done like that then, but it had a much greater meaning. The symbolism is where it's really at in biblical numerology. Now, let me give you some examples. Well, I already talked about the 12 apostles representing the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? We get that harmonious connection of the plurality. Um, how about the idea of feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes? Five loaves, a very human number. Two fishes, the number of society. Jesus is feeding all of human society. Had it been four loaves and three fishes, it would mean something entirely different. Right? I would emphasize, and I cannot emphasize too strongly, that you cannot read Scripture too carefully. It is all music and no noise. If you thought the number of fishes and the number of loaves was a throwaway line, nay, you are not reading deeply enough. All of these things have symbolic consequences. Within the Gospel of John, there's a very, there are a number of very fine examples of numerology. One of the most interesting is the miracle of Lazarus. Lazarus is raised from the dead. How many days is Lazarus in the tomb? Well, they really don't need to tell you, because the whole point of it is that you're going to get eternal life if you are faithful and you believe in Jesus. But since they do want to give you the numerical number, or the, the numerical symbol, they say Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. Four is a very earthly number. It must have been a very earthly death. And when Lazarus is, re is resurrected, he's not given eternal life. He's just given more of the same old human life. Why? Because he was in the tomb four days. Jesus, on the other hand, is not in the tomb four days. He's in the tomb three days. And when he res is resurrected, then we have the number of heaven. And the number of heaven means that this life will be qualitatively different from the renewal of life that Lazarus got. If you thought that the number of the days was just insignificant. There was merely a detail. No, there's no such thing as a mere detail in the Bible. The Bible is all music, no noise. If you are running through passages that don't seem to mean anything, go back and read them again. You will find that you're overlooking things that you would prefer to be able to glean out, and you will be able to glean them out if you work on the symbolic rather than the literal level. The most rewarding and useful way 
It's to move from the surface to the depth, from the externalities to the internal facts of the gospel. And there you'll find a, an almost infinite amount of richness. If you know a, uh, what Alcibiades says about Socrates at the end of the symposium, where he says, when you remove the image of the satyr, we, we, we find inside a little images of the gods, perfect golden images. Well, what we find when we remove the skin of appearance from the gospel messages, what we see are aspects of the divine which are hidden and yet meant for our discovery. So there is no book that will repay a careful reading the way a reading of the Bible will. Do not overlook anything. There is nothing there which should be overlooked. Now, the final and big example of numerology, the most important and intractable example of numerology in the entire biblical tradition as far as I'm concerned, is chapter 21 of the book of John, lowering of the net, bringing up of 153 fishes. So far as I can tell, there are no other references to the number 153 in the Bible. I looked. It is the kind of thing that definitely means something, and something deep and profound, but it is a very difficult question to tease out. I will try, towards the end of my lecture, to take a stab at undoing the, the cords of symbolism which bind us and prevent us from getting access to this message. But that final chapter, chapter 21 of the book of John, is arguably the most difficult chapter in all of the New Testament. It is Gnostic, it is full of deep and esoteric symbolism, and it is obviously a later edition. Uh, it's the second conclusion to the Gospel of John, as if it needed more than one. Well, there's a great deal of number magic going on there, and you should read the final chapter, the concluding chapter in John, read it ten times before you develop any opinions about it. It is very, very difficult. It will repay your careful concern. Now, let's take numerology even further. Not only do we have numbers explicitly mentioned, which have symbolic reference in the Gospel of John, but the number of times things happen make a big difference in the Gospel of John. In the first case, we see that there are signs, because remember the Gospel of John is borrowing from the signs gospel, which is a kind of precursor to John. Before Jesus' death and resurrection, there are six big signs. And it's not that anything could happen six times <laughs> and happen accidentally, not in the Bible. If there are six signs, and particularly as is in the case with the Gospel of John, each one of these six signs is balanced by an I am statement, in which Jesus reveals some new aspect of his personality, and each of these six signs corresponds to a six I am statements, just and that, that these, these signs, these six, uh, this set of six, conclude just before the death and resurrection of Jesus, the symbolic implications are obviously enormous. Remember that six is the number of evil. It is the number of moral corruption. If we have six signs and six I am statements that are given to this world prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus, what, he, what is being gestured at here is the idea that the human world is corrupt. <coughs> prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus, the condition of mankind is unredeemed. And we won't get that seventh sign which is, of course, a very auspicious biblical number, until we come to the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And the seventh sign is this miracle of the dropping of the net at Jesus' command and the bringing up of the 153 large fishes. So clearly the fact that there are six signs and six I am statements prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus, and then he resurrects himself, comes back, reveals himself to his disciples, and then performs one more miracle to turn the six into seven? The symbolism is very deep, and it is this that binds what appear to be the disjointed elements of this gospel together. And it's important to emphasize that if you do not do the symbolic reading of John, it's very trying to get through it. All kinds of strange stuff happens in the Jesus narrative in John that doesn't happen in the other gospels. For example, there's, a, there's not a very continuous narration of what Jesus does. In the gospel of John, there's constant, ba constant movement back and forth from Galilee to Jerusalem to Galilee to Jerusalem and to the journey on the way. Um, for uh, one, the most striking example of this is that the high point of the Synoptic Gospels, or one prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus, the high point is the journey to Jerusalem and chasing the money changers out of the temple because he is cleansing the tradition of Yahweh's religion. It has tremendous symbolic repercussions. In John, it doesn't happen that way. 
there's a symbolic necessity for Jesus to go to Jerusalem to cleanse the temple, to drive the money changers out of the temple, but in the Gospel of John it happens almost immediately. It's in the third chapter. So, so we are bouncing back and forth from scene to scene. John touches all the symbolic bases, but he does it in a very different way and in a very, with a very different set of intentions from the synoptic uh, evangelists. They're writing to get the Jesus message across to particular audiences in particular ways. John is sort of, you might say that he's batting cleanup for the evangelists. He's the final batter, he's the, the long ball hitter, and he's going to give us this, this symbolic synthesis that brings it all together. Part of the symbolism will be verbal, the word. Other symbolism will be numerical, all this sixes and sevens and threes and forties. Other parts of it will be involved in the manipulations and the alterations he imposes on the Jesus story that he borrows from the synoptics. Now, the uh, first part of the Gospel of John might be thought of as the Word made flesh. The, there's a great prologue, which is the first 18 verses of the first chapter, and what happens in the beginning is that it seems that this is a hymn, perhaps from the, from the particular Christian tradition that the evangelist came from, and the hymn involves an articulation of the names of God. There's all kinds of sacred name magic going on in the, in the first chapter of John. Jesus is called the Word, the Son, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Christ. Now, Jesus, most all, in most of the Gospels, Jesus usually calls himself the Son of Man, and that's a very enigmatic statement. We are kind of used, particularly if, you're, if one is uh, accustomed to reading the Gospel stories, we're, we're accustomed to seeing Jesus or hearing Jesus described as the Son of Man. But if you pause to think about it, it's quite enigmatic to be called, in the same chapter of the same book, the Son of Man and the Son of God. It's clear enough how he could be the Son of God. Well because he is another incarnation of Yahweh, one of the aspects of the divinity. But to call him the Son of Man is very difficult, rather more enigmatic. What does he have to do with people? He's perfectly morally virtuous, so unlike us. One way of trying to solve this problem, looking at this name magic, would be to handle it like this. The Son of Man might be thought of as the perfect human being. In other words, Jesus would be the only person that ever realized the potentials of humanity. He's what we would be like if we weren't so corrupt and wicked. So in other words, we are not quite human. Jesus points the way to real humanity, and that's what the Son of Man title means. So he is the, the one who realizes the potentials locked within human beings. He is the one who undoes the narrow shackles of egoism towards some larger cosmic relationship with the divinity. The Son of Man symbolism runs through the Gospels. It is more important in the Synoptics than in John, but since Jesus calls himself on a couple of occasions the Son, it's pretty clear that he wants to have it both ways, simultaneously be the Son of God and the Son of Man. All of this connects back to the, num to the word magic theme. Now, Jesus meets a considerable amount of, op uh, of opposition. He uh, cleanses the temple early because it's very clear that he's imposing this new order early in the narration that we get from John. And the final part, of, or the, the part that connects the passion and death of Christ to this early hymn and the set of, of word magic themes might be thought of as the word made flesh. Jesus, the Logos, goes and performs these signs. The parables are left out for the purposes of John, performs these signs and makes the corresponding I am statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am eternal life. I am the light of the world. A whole complex of related images and metaphors are linked together using these I am statement as the bridge between the six early signs and then moving on towards the seventh and final sign. Now, once we get to the concluding part of the gospel, when we get to chapters 13 to 20, God's glory is revealed. And this is also a big departure that we see in the Gospel of John that isn't found in the synoptics. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' death is awful, it is gruesome, it is bloody. All of the synoptics share a, a certain fascination in the, the awful details of the crowning with thorns and the scourging. 
it's not represented that way in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, Jesus' death and resurrection is glorious. It is the glorified, resurrected body that John always has in the back of his mind. He downplays the gruesome elements that are so luridly detailed in the Synoptic Gospels. In John, getting nailed to the cross is the, ap well, the apotheosis is the wrong word. It is the, the high point, the turning point, the ultimate event in the human world. And although suffering and death are entailed in it, those are minor, merely human details. The important thing is that Jesus the Christ is resurrected, and that means that we are all offered the chance to participate in eternal life. We are all offered illumination from the light of the world. This account of the suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus is fundamentally different from the tradition we get in the synoptics. John is try has bigger fish to fry. He is trying to take it to, a, in a, to another level. And in fact, I would say that John succeeds. Now, here's where the postscript, chapter 21 in John, is so important. It appears that this was a later edition. It is likely that some other group or some other redactors of the John tradition tacked chapter 21 on. It already has a conclusion. It really doesn't need a second conclusion. But this second conclusion, this chapter 21, is loaded with symbolism, number symbolism, word symbolism, all kinds of symbolism, and it connects to the story of the net. So it is worth us having a look at. Think about it this way. What happens is this. The disciples are out fishing. Jesus has resurrected himself, and he displays himself to the disciples. And they see him on the shore, and he asks, have you caught any fish? And it turns out they haven't. The fishing has been bad. So Jesus says, throw your net out on the other side of the boat. And they do. And as a re result of obeying God's command, they pull up as many fish as the net can hold. And what is stressed here is that the net remains unbroken. It is capable of being filled to completion, to finish. It is filled with as much of the fish, in this case the spiritual food of life, as can possibly be held in a human net. And Peter's net turns out to be more than simply a device for catching fish. It is a metaphor or a symbol. I would be inclined to say that it is not merely symbolic, it is a meta-symbol. Chapter 21 of the Gospel of John, this image of the net, refers back to the whole gospel tradition. The gospels taken together offer us an unbroken net of images. And this unbroken network of metaphors and images, which contain the spiritual food of life, which do not break under the stress, but contain as much as any human thing can possibly contain, this is what the seventh sign is all about, and this is why it is tacked on to the end of the last of the Gospels. If you read attentively and carefully and with the proper frame of mind, the Gospels will teach you how to read them. They are, in a unique and peculiar way, a self-explanatory text. It's just that the sort of explanation that is involved requires a very considerable degree of application and symbolic play. You have to be flexible. Do not think that 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 2 may be something else. They're not doing that kind of linear logical analysis. When you get to the symbolic level, then and only then can you begin to read the richest and most important parts of the Gospels. In this case, I would say the Gospel of John. Now, I have read quite a bit of commentary trying to give you an explanation of what 153 means. I have to admit that the numerology involved in 153 makes particle physics look simple, makes brain surgery look like a walk in the park. There is an amazing amount of ink that has been spilled trying to explain these 153 fish. Obviously, there are some resonances which are immediately connected. First of all, the fish is the symbol of Jesus. Ictus is the symbol of Jesus and the early Christian movement. The fact that it's, the net is as full of fish as you can possibly get suggests to us that the spiritual food of life in its completeness is being offered to us. But in addition to that, it turns out that certain biblical scholars in working on this number 153 have concluded that it is 
a borrowing from an earlier Pythagorean tradition of number magic. And of course, Pythagorean number magic goes back a very long way in the history of the ancient Mediterranean. And from that, even back to earlier strata of human history. And I won't give you the details because the, just the graph and the explanation of what the 153 amounts to, that's a lecture by itself. The best analysis I've seen of it, given of it goes about 30 pages. 30 pages trying to explain what 153 means, and the graph for it is amazing. It's rocket science. It's really hard, but I'm quite confident that if all the other numbers in the Bible mean something, they can't be finishing off the Gospel of John with 153 fish capriciously, arbitrarily. The evangelists don't work that way. Now, to cut to the chase, my understanding of the 153, or the best explanation that I've gotten, is that it is triadic symbolism I know that that may sound esoteric, and it is esoteric, and the construction is quite complex. I, will, I can refer you to the source if you are interested, but for now, for the purposes of our discussion, let's assume that it does refer to a triadic set of distinctions. Originally, the triadic distinction was between the three levels of the cosmos, but in the context of the Gospels, it seems to me that the triadic distinction has to refer back to the Trinity and to the importance of three as a heavenly number. So let's assume that the 153 fish are, in a very elaborate and complex way, triadic symbolism. Well, it turns out that the triadic symbols that run through the Gospels, and in fact run through the whole Bible, are changeable or transformable one into the other. And once you realize that these symbols, these triads, flip one into the other into the other, then you are beginning to scratch the surface of the network, the unbroken network that the Gospels are. Let me give you some examples. In the, at the time the Gospels are being written, physical understanding of the physical world is fairly primitive. One of the usual parsings for the world, or the world of space and time any, would be, any, anyway, would be into animal, vegetable, and mineral. Now suppose we were to take those kind of rough and ready, rather primitive and archaic categories, and go back and look at the Gospels. Will we find Jesus represented under the guise of animal, vegetable, and mineral? Indeed we will. If you go back to the Gospel of Luke, you will find that the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And that's a very mineral sort of a reference. It will turn out that minerals figure quite heavily, and I'll, I'll try and explain to you why I think that that mineral symbolism is quite important, that this foundation will harken back to the book of Exodus where we get water from the rock, rock symbolism. But we don't just have mineral symbolism, we also have animal and vegetable. Jesus tells the, his uh, disciples, if I remember correctly, that I am the vine and you are the branches, doesn't Jesus describe himself as the true vine? It turns out that that's the vegetable symbol for Jesus and his community. I am the vine, you are the branches. It's quite clear what the animal symbolism will be. Jesus is the Lamb of God whose blood is poured out for the rectification of a corrupt world. Animal, vegetable, and mineral, this triad covers the entire domain of space and spatiotemporal things as far as the ancients are concerned. Jesus permeates the universe. But we're just getting started with that triad. Let us consider liquids and how they symbolize Jesus, because they will be keyed into this triadic symbolism of animal, vegetable, and mineral. It turns out that in the book of Exodus, in the foundation, which is connected to the idea of a cornerstone, turns out that when the Jewish people need help because they're wandering in the desert and have no water, Turns out that the water of life is given to them when they knock on the rock. Water is connected to rock, and rock is connected to foundation. And the foundation of the, Jewish, uh, of the biblical religion is the connection to Yahweh. Connected with the vine is another liquid. You may have heard of it. It's wine. And wine symbolism runs all through the Gospels. Think of the Last Supper. It also turns out that connected with the lamb and with the animal symbolism is another liquid, blood and blood of the sacrifice both of the Old Testament animals and of the New Testament Christ, again, connects water to rock, wine to the vine, blood to the sacrificial lamb of God. So it's not merely that these triads are three of things, they all connect one to the other. I am the vine, you are the branches. It also turns out that in the Gospel of John, first miracle he does, remember that first sign? It's the miracle at Cana, he changes water into wine. And you know what he does at the Last Supper? Changes wine into blood. 
it would seem that we can transfer one set of symbols to the other, that the transformation of these triads is the unbroken network that the Gospels contain secretly hidden within them. I'm not finished with triads. How about the temptations of Jesus? Each of those, uh, the, the temptation of changing these stones into bread, stone once again, uh, the idea of having the kingdoms of the world bow down to him, and the idea of having, uh, of, uh, of um, Jesus being protected and throwing himself off the temple in Jerusalem, each one of those temptations is keyed into these images, animal, vegetable, mineral, and also keyed into these images connected with liquids. The Christian virtues, faith, hope, and charity, well, it turns out that Yahweh, and faith in Yahweh is a sort of foundation to biblical religion. Jesus offers uh, an unredeemed world, hope for the second coming of Christ and for the final apocalypse, and charity is what will sustain Jesus' church in the time between, when, between Jesus being, going back into heaven and the second coming of Christ. So we're going to have a connection between the Christian virtues, between the temptations of Jesus, between the typical liquid metaphors used to represent Jesus, between the things used to represent Jesus, and in addition to that, to the ages of human history. Remember the Gospel of Luke broke the ages of human history down into the, the age of the covenant between Abraham and Yahweh, the age of Jesus, and then the age of the church? Well, it turns out that when Yahweh gives water out of the rock to his people as a sort of foundation of biblical religion, and faith being the, uh, the virtue connected with Yahweh, it will turn out, fortunately for us, that that represents the age of Israel. Symbolism revolving around wine and vines, and symbolism involving hope and the kingdoms of this world, all connect to the age of Jesus, the central part of human history. And the final set of symbolisms, the idea of the Lamb of God, the age of the church. The age of the church turns out to be the age of blood. The age of blood is, the blo is represented in the blood of the martyrs that we see in, for example, St. Stephen being stoned in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. So, if we can take for, as a, as a matter of assumption, the idea that the 153 is triadic, and I think that that's a justifiable, defensible proposition. It's not defensible within the parameters of the few minutes that I have here. But let's take that assumption. I think that I can, within the parameters of time that I have here, give you good reason to believe that the gospel message is a carefully, nay, perfectly constructed set of metaphors. And that is what the unbroken net of Peter is, and that's what the seventh sign is. The Bible itself, the living Word of God that contains within it the spiritual food of life, is the final seventh sign. And that's why it is the last chapter in the last gospel. It is a spiritual and symbolic and metaphorical fugue. It's like the end of one of the great works by Bach. All themes are resolved. All ambiguities melt into one unified revelation. And the unified revelation is that there is an infinite amount of fish in the net, an infinite amount of spiritual food. I would be inclined to say that the infinitude of the unbroken net and the infinitude of the 153 fish is best represented in the one parable or the one miracle that is found in all four of the Gospels because of all the stories of Jesus' Jesus' miracles and his signs and his wonderful doings, there's only one Jesus story that makes its way into all four of the Gospels. And if such a self-conscious and carefully symbolic writer as John were to include only this one sign that's included in the other synoptics, clearly this is the most important sign for John. It is a way for us to think about the whole message of the Gospels. The one sign that is found in every, oh, the one miracle sign that is found in every gospel is the feeding of the 5,000 people with the loaves and the fishes. And this infinitude of spiritual food that is gestured at in this story, the idea that there is no number of people that will exhaust God's spiritual resources and spiritual plenty, the, the infinite magnanimity and generosity of God is reflected in the fact that John intends, uh, decides to include that one parable, and it is particularly represented in the idea that the net is filled to the breaking point with all the fish that it can possibly contain. Read the Gospels carefully, appreciate the symbolism and the dramatic and intense poetry, but do not ever 
think that you have gotten to the bottom of the gospel message. In fact, there is an inf infinite meal, an infinite amount of spiritual food, which you will find to be inexhaustible. The net is infinite. The contents are infinite as well. What the scriptures offer us is an introduction or an access to an infinite amount of spiritual life formulated in a network of metaphor.